And now stay tuned for the mystery program that is unique among all mystery programs. Because even when you know who is guilty, you always receive a startling surprise at the final curtain. In the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline, invite you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. I am The Whistler, and I know many things for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now for the Signal Oil Company, the Whistler's strange story, a friendly case of blackmail. In this world, there are two kinds of people. Those who do things and those who dream about doing them. That was the philosophy of Albert Goodman. At least, that's the way he explained it to his old friend George, George Wilson. It was the night George came over to Albert's apartment to ask for some money, a loan. Yes, Al, a, a couple of thousand dollars. A couple of thousand? What in the world do you need that much money for, George? You never had that much money in your life. I know. I. Well, you see, I, I want to get married. Married? <laughs> Why, George, after all these years, I thought you were a confirmed bachelor like me. Well, I've just never been able to afford to before. No, 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 I suppose not. Still, George, maybe having a wife will inspire you. Make you... Help you make something out of yourself. Start a new career, perhaps. Oh, I, I couldn't leave Shannon and Reed not after all these years. Oh, why not? You're still on the same job you were when I left there 18 years ago, aren't you? Oh, I've had some raises. Well, that's something, of course, but you haven't advanced your position. No, I'm still a bookkeeper. Well, I understand many bookkeepers are married and quite happy, but some women want a lot, you know. A car, clothes, jewels. Oh, no, no, Ethel's different. Oh, oh, I see. Well, I'm very glad to hear that. Anyway, it's your business. You do what you want to do. But the $2,000 you're asking me for, George, that's a lot of money. If you don't have it as a bachelor, I don't see how you expect to put away enough after you're married to repay me. I'm afraid I can't let you have it. Al, I, I thought... I know, I know. We've been friends for a long time. And believe me, George, I'm refusing to lend you this money as your friend. Borrowing that much money to get married on is a big mistake. But Ethel doesn't want to wait. And I... In that case, you'll just have to make the best of your present situation. Then start doing something to better yourself. It's time you did anyway. I don't exactly know what you mean. Well, I'll tell you, George. There are two kinds of people in this world. People who do things and people who only dream about doing them. Now, take us, for example. Us? Sure. Twenty years ago, we were both in the same spot. Bookkeeping for a second-rate investment company for a hundred bucks a month. We both had the same chance to get ahead. Today, I have most of the things I want. Money, position. I've earned them, George. And you? Me. I have to come to you for money to get married on. Yeah, I think I see what you mean. No, don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. All I'm saying is that you've got to set your sights high and then work like the very devil to reach your goal. Sure. Well, Al, I... I guess there's nothing more to say. Believe me, George, I'm sorry, but... Honestly, I think you'll thank me someday for not lending you this money. Maybe you're right, Al. I don't know. Maybe you're right. Well, George, your old friend Al doesn't think you're a good financial risk, does he? And in the name of friendship, he's given a very unflattering description of yourself as a person. A dreamer, he calls you. Not a doer. And you know how right he is. You're afraid right now, afraid that Ethel won't wait. That all the dreams you've dreamed will fade into ashes, just as they've always done. You have to do something, don't you, George? Especially after you talk to Ethel that evening. Well, of course I love you, George, but we have to have money to live. We want a home at least. Uh, I, I just talked with Al. Al? 
Oh, he's your friend with lots of money, isn't he? Say, maybe he could help us out at the start. That's what I talked to him about. Oh, did he say he'd help you? He said he'd do me the biggest favor a guy could do. Well, then what are we worrying about, honey? He didn't give me any money. Huh? Oh, well, why not? Oh, it doesn't matter. But he did do me a big favor. He gave me an idea. An idea about what to do. Yeah, what? Ethel. Do you love me? Oh, you know I do, honey. And you don't care too much where our money comes from? I mean, as long as we have plenty? Well... Enough to buy you everything you want? Oh, gee, honey. What you do is your own business. As long as you don't get into trouble. Okay. Well, Al reminds me of something today. You see, Al left Shannon and Reed about 18 years ago, and no one heard of him for several years. Al doesn't know it, but I know where he spent those years. Where was he? In prison. In prison? Why? Embezzlement. Oh, Mr. Shannon told me before he died. Oh, the whole thing was handled very quietly. Al replaced the money he'd taken from the firm, served his time. And since he's been out, he's been a model citizen, made good in a big way. Don't other people know about it? I doubt if anyone does. Mr. Shannon kept it pretty quiet, kept it out of the papers. And nobody in the organization knew what happened. <laughs> we all thought Al had gone east. <laughs> And now he's sitting on top of the world. That's a nice spot to be sitting in. Yeah. Most of all, Al's proud of his solid position, his good standing in the community and all. You know, I wonder just how great a value Al does put on his position in life. George, you don't mean... I mean blackmail, Ethel. Oh, let's say a, a friendly case of blackmail. <laughs> Are you the kind of motorist who gets fun out of driving? Then just for the fun of it, here's an experiment I'd like for you to make. Try just one tankful of Signal Ethel, the premium quality of Signal's famous go-farther gasoline, engineered to bring out the best in any car. Yes, if you like fun, you'll get sweet satisfaction out of the prompt obedience with which Signal Ethel makes your motor respond to the starter. If it's fun you like, it's fun you'll have when the traffic light goes green and your signal Ethel Pep makes other drivers turn green. And if it's fun you like, you'll still be having it as Ethel signals Ethel's power whisks you effortlessly down highways and up hills with the hushed purr of your motor echoing your own feelings of relaxed contentment. Yes, driving can be fun. And you'll be sure you're having all the fun your motor has to offer if you just fill up next time at a Signal service station. Fill up with Signal Ethel. You're really taking Al's advice to do something, aren't you? The next day, you carefully print a note to Al on a plain piece of paper demanding $5,000. There'll be no telltale marks to identify you. Then you send Ethel down to Phoenix for the weekend with explicit instructions about how to mail it from there. Then you wait. Al will get it when he gets home Monday evening. Then the fireworks will start. After all, Joe... You're his best friend. If he talks to anyone, it'll be to you. So you sit around your drab little apartment and wait. Finally. Why, Al! Well, this is a surprise. I gotta talk to you, George. Sure, sure, come in. Thanks. Uh, sit down. Thank you. Uh, George... Do any of the old gang from Shannon and Reed live down around Phoenix? Gosh, I don't know, Al. I haven't kept track of any of them. Except you. Why, are you going down there for a vacation or something? No, no, I... I got something in the mail today. Here, take a look at this. This is strange. It's printed. Yes. Go on, read it. Good one. Understand you're doing very well for an ex-convict... If you want to keep the past dead, you'll have to pay me $5,000. 
If I know you, you won't want your present friends and business associates to know that you served time for embezzlement. Why, Al, that's blackmail. Yes, blackmail. Yes, blackmail. Al, surely it's not true. I'm afraid it is, George. Mr. Shannon was the right guy. Kept it very quiet. Even let me tell everyone I was going east for a few years the day the auditors caught up with me. But I really went to prison. George, if this gets out, it'll ruin me. Oh, you paid for your mistake? Yes, I know I have, but apparently I haven't paid enough. People are funny about ex-convicts. I, I just can't let this get out now, George. It would kill me. You, you're my best friend. Maybe you can help me. Huh? Well, I'll do anything I can, Al. Good. Now, I'm supposed to leave the money in small bills in a shoebox on the top of the mailbox on the corner of Franklin and Hudson tomorrow at 3 in the morning. But you're not going to do it. I tell you, George, I've got to. But I want you to be there hiding somewhere to see if you can see who picks it up. You mean you're going to try to track down who this blackmailer is? Of course. I'll pay this time, but I'm going to find out who's doing this. And when I do, well, that guy, whoever he is, will be in for plenty of trouble. Yeah. Yeah, he, he sure will. You're frightened, aren't you, George? Al was right about you, wasn't he? Inside, you're a weakling. Still, you're determined to go through with it. And Al's making it easier for you, isn't he? He wants you to watch the blackmailer's pickup. That will make everything much simpler. And the following morning at a quarter of three, you're standing in the shadows across the street from the mailbox. The street is deserted, silent. Soon, Al walks past you, nodding silently. Then he crosses the street, places the shoebox on top of the mailbox, and goes on. A minute before three, the lights of a car swing into the street. Ethel's right on time. As she pulls to a quick stop, rush across the street, pick up the shoebox and toss it into the open car window. Then Ethel steps on the gas. She's out of sight in ten seconds. Everything perfect. You slip out of the shadows and head for your rendezvous with Al. Halfway down the block, you pass an alley and... George! Oh, Al! Oh, I... I thought you'd be down the next corner. I doubled back and hid here in the alley. Did you, uh... Did you see anything? Oh, just the car pulling away and turning up the side street. I couldn't see what kind it was. Could you? Well, just it was a sedan, about, a, I think, a 46. But I did get part of the license. 6I42. Oh, that's something, Al. And you can check up on that tomorrow at the Department of Motor Vehicles. Yes, I will. And the man, did you see him? No. I guess that's why they wanted to put on top of the mailbox. They just slowed up and scooped it in. They? There were more than one? Well, I, I think so. I'm not, I'm not sure. Gee, I'm sorry, Al. I... I guess I wasn't much help. Oh, that's, that's okay. We got part of a license number. I think you were more help than you realize. What did Al mean by that, George? The pickup went all right, didn't it? He couldn't have seen you go over and toss Ethel the shoebox, could he? Well, it's done now. And you're sure that phony license number you told him about will take Al off on a wild goose chase for a while. He's checking it himself. And you're jittery the next day as you wait for him to get back from the license bureau with the news. And finally, when he comes... Well, wh what did you find out, Al? One thing that you slipped up, George. I... I slipped... slipped up? Yes. You see, there are no licenses in this state that use the letter I. 6I42, you said, wasn't it? And it's a wrong number. Oh, well, I... I, I... Oh, yeah, sure, sure, I know. You just made a mistake. It was dark, the car was moving, everybody can make a mistake like that. Yeah. Too bad, though, that license number was our only clue. Gee, I'm sorry, Al. Well, it, it looks like we're up a blind alley. Oh, no. No, I've got a couple of ideas. I'm going to Phoenix for the weekend. Phoenix, George. You wonder if Ethel could have left a clue behind her. If anyone saw her in Phoenix who could connect her with you. But all you can do is wait over the long weekend. On Monday, Al is back. But you don't hear from him all day. By nighttime, you're jittery. And when Ethel stops by and wants you to take her out, you tell her you have to wait for Al's phone call. Both of you wait nervously until it comes. Oh, this is it. 
Hello? George? Oh, yes, Al. Uh, any luck? Yes, a little. I checked all the hotels and tourist camps for people from Los Angeles who were in Phoenix the day the blackmail letter was mailed. Yeah? And I found one. Oh? A girl named Ethel Martin lives on Orange Drive. I'm just going over there now to look her up. Oh. Oh, I see. Well, uh, <laughs> good luck. Yeah. Well, I'll let you know what I find. Goodbye. Yeah. G- g- goodbye. George. George, what's the matter? You. He found out you were in Phoenix. What? Oh, we got to get out of town. I guess you're right. Well, with that 5000 we got from Al... That $5,000 won't go very far. But that's all there is. We can get more. The same way you got the 5000 Only this time, we'll get a big stake and clear out. Oh, no, honey. It's too risky. Al's too close already. Not if he doesn't find me. What? It's even riskier not to send another letter. Especially since you asked him to lend you money. He's got to get another letter or he'll figure the back blackmailer was, was just somebody that knew him and, and needed a few thousand. And that's you, George. Golly, maybe you're right. I never thought about that. Yeah, this time we'll ask for 25000 I don't know just how we'll do it, but I'll figure something out. Well, George, you're finding out something that Al didn't know. That weakness can make people do things, too. You're frightened, but you can't turn back. Next day, you try to figure a smart way to send the next letter. And you get the idea when you go up to meet Ethel for lunch. She works in a big office. And just outside the door, you find the cleaning man has left the trash basket to be picked up. Right on top, George, staring you in the face is an open envelope, postmarked San Francisco. It's just what you need, isn't it, George? You reach down and pick it up. Oh, oh pardon me. Oh, nearly knocked you over. That's all right. I, I shouldn't have been standing in front of the door. Looking for something? No, no. I, uh, I, I, I just wanted to write a note. I, I was just picking up a piece of waste paper. I see. Well, I guess nobody will miss a piece of waste paper. No, no. I, I, I guess not. Still a weakling, aren't you, George? frightened because a man sees you take that envelope out of the trash barrel. And he'll probably forget it in a matter of minutes. But everything frightens you now, doesn't it? That afternoon, you take some ink remover and carefully remove the address from the back of the envelope and the return address from the back. Then you print Al's name and address carefully, slip a new blackmail note into it, and place it securely in your pocket. You'll take no more chances with Ethel. This job you'll do yourself. Early that evening, you walk to Al's apartment. And after making sure there's no one in sight, you hastily slip it into his mailbox and return quickly to your apartment. Certain you'll hear from Al as quickly as he finds the letter. Al, what's up? Why all the noise? George, it's it's another blackmail note. Look, look. Well, I'll be... This time they want 25,000. Pick up in the same place Friday night. It gives me three days to raise the money. Well, are you going to pay it? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Also, it gives me three days to track down the blackmailer. Yeah. A- any ideas? Yeah. This envelope's postmarked San Francisco, but that doesn't mean anything. Oh, no. Why not? Because this wasn't delivered by mail. I picked up all of my mail when I got home this evening. Then I went out to have dinner, and while I was gone, somebody slipped this in my box. Oh, what, uh, what makes you think so? There's no special delivery stamp on it. This envelope's been used before. How do you know that? The original address was removed with ink remover. You can see the yellow stain, you see? Uh-huh. Now watch while I hold it in front of the light. You see those pen scratches? Yeah, but you can't tell what they are. No, the new address written over has obscured them. But you can make out something of the name, you see? It's Rap... Rap... Rafferty. Yeah, that's it, you see? Rafferty. Rafferty. You can make out part of the return address, too. San Francisco 14. Yeah, I think uh, I think maybe you're right. Uh, no, I've got something. Rafferty, San Francisco, 14. I'll go up there tomorrow, and if I can find out who that letter was written to down here, then I may have the trail. And believe me, George, if I find this guy, he'll wish he'd never started this. You already wish you hadn't started it, don't you, George? And all the time Albert is in San Francisco, you're jittery. Even though you tell yourself that no matter what he finds out, 
he can't connect his findings with you. But as one day passes and then another, your fears grow. Finally, the next day, you can stand it no longer. You decide to leave town immediately. Hurry to Ethel's office, and you walk in the door. Oh, hello, darling. How nice. Just in time to take me to lunch. Yeah, yeah. Come on, hurry. What? George! George, what's the matter? That man, that man in your office in the brown top coat, that was Al. Al? You mean... Yes. What's he doing here? I don't know. He came in a few minutes ago. I thought he was still in San Francisco. Who was that other man, the one he was talking to? The man he asked for? Or Jim, Jim Rafferty. Jim Rafferty? Yes. Oh, what's the matter, George? That, that man Rafferty. He's the one who saw me pick up the envelope in the trash barrel. The one I put the blackmail letter in. It was his envelope. Come on, honey. We've got to get out of here fast. <laughs> Well, George, Al was a much better detective than you even suspected, wasn't he? It's all quite clear, isn't it? He just returned from San Francisco, and while he was there, he found the Rafferty family. Then learned that the envelope you'd found in the trash barrel had been sent to Jim Rafferty, employed in the same office with Ethel. Now it's a race to get away. You're certain he's on your trail. You and Ethel, hurry out of the office. No time to wait for the elevator. Take the stairs, race down, but not fast enough. Just as you get to the bottom hall, the elevator door opens and out steps Al. Well, hello, George. Oh, oh Al. Oh, hello. I, uh, I didn't expect to see you here. No, and I didn't expect to see you either. Shannon and Reed haven't moved to this building, have they? Oh, no, 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 no. I, I, I just came over. To, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't introduce you. This is my fiance, Miss uh, Smith. Happy to know you, Miss Smith. Uh, you remember Al, honey. I talked so much about him. Oh, yes, yes, of course. How do you do? George, I want to talk to you. Suppose we could make it dinner tonight at my place, just like old times? Gee, I, I, I'm sorry, Al. This I... is important, George. Well... And I'm sure that Miss Smith won't mind one night. Oh, no, no, of course not. Good. Then six at my place, George. Just the two of us. <laughs> Well, George, you have to face him, don't you? Flight now would mean confession. And wherever you went, especially with Ethel, you'd be found. So at six o'clock, you're at Al's apartment. Al is jovial, friendly as you eat dinner. You just play along with him, watching for anything, waiting, afraid, just as he said you were. Then after dinner, he fixes two drinks and places them on the table, one at your place and one at his. This is it. Your drink is poisoned, you're sure of that. You can tell by the careful way he mixed them behind your back. The way he sets them down, carefully, not spilling anything. So you have to act fast. Oh, say, Al, I forgot my cigarettes. Uh, do you have any? Uh, sure, of course, I'll get you one. Okay. He turns his back for a minute to get the cigarettes. With one quick movement, you switch the two drinks. Then he's back. Ah, there you are. Oh, thanks. Now, how about a toast, George? Oh, to friendship. There's very little of it left these days. Yeah, I'll drink to friendship. <laughs> yes, there are very few friendships like ours, George. That's why I wanted you here tonight. You see, George, one of those drinks we just had was poisoned. Yes, I know that, Al. You know? I'm not as stupid as you think. I know that you found out I was blackmailing you. And I knew you'd planned to kill me. It was the only way you could keep your past covered up. If you'd had me arrested, everything would have come out. But I fooled you, Al. I fooled you. Because while you got the cigarettes, I switched the drinks. No. No, George. Yes. Yes, Al. That's right. Turn white. Now it's your turn to be afraid. Go on, Al. You said you were different. A strong man. A doer. All right. Now let's see how strong you are. <laughs> To be sure that the automobile battery you buy today will last a long while, you want to be sure you're choosing a good one. And you can be sure if you choose a Signal Deluxe, the battery which embodies what has been called the greatest battery improvement in 20 years. 
I'm talking about Signal's Microporous All Rubber Separators. Because they hold twice as much acid solution between the plates, Signal Deluxe batteries deliver up to 35% more power. Plenty for extra quick starting, plus the many electrical gadgets on today's cars. As a result, these super-powered batteries stand up so well, Signal guarantees them a full 30 months on a service basis. That's up to two and one-half times as long as many ordinary batteries, which means that all the while you're enjoying its dependable, trouble-free performance, a Signal Deluxe battery is actually costing less per month. Less than you think, because your Signal dealer will not only trade in your old battery, but has liberal credit terms available. So when you need a new battery, play safe. Get a good one. Get a Signal Deluxe battery at a Signal service station. So, George, you've outwitted Al at last. You didn't get the 25000 but you're certain you'll be free, and no one will ever know about your blackmailing your friend. Al is pale, trembling. You're sure he'll be dead in a very few minutes. He can't even phone a doctor, can he, George? Not while you're there to prevent it. You smile at his first words. George. George, you don't know what you've done. I think I do. I have simply outsmarted you. You told me how you were the kind who did things, that I was the kind who just dreamed. Well, this time I've switched things on you, literally. On yourself, George. What do you mean? I mean you'll be dead in a few minutes. I? Yes, I didn't intend to kill you. It was my drink that was poisoned. <laughs> Your drink? Yes. I told you I was the kind who did things. Well, I simply followed out my own philosophy. I've spent too many years building myself to lose everything, so I decided to end things deliberately. Rather than have my life ruined by a blackmailer, a blackmailer I couldn't trace. But you couldn't trace? That's right. That man Rafferty was my last chance, and when he told me how the trash barrel was accessible to anyone, that he'd seen a man pick an envelope out of it but didn't remember what he looked like, I figured my situation was hopeless. And there wasn't any use going on. You mean you, you, you didn't know about me? I didn't even suspect you. But you've settled the score for me. You've brought on your own punishment. Al, Al, look, do something. Oh, it's too late, George, much too late. No one in the world can help you. And the funny part of it is I was doing everything for you. You were getting the big favor you asked. I, I don't get it. I... I knew you were a weakling, George, that you'd never do anything on your own, but I liked you in spite of your weakness. So when I decided to take my life, I wrote out a will... A will leaving everything I have to you. Let that whistle be your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. This month throughout America, churchmen of all faiths are calling special attention to the part religion plays in building and preserving our American way of life. Religion is one of the freedoms our forefathers fought for, one which today more than ever needs not only our protection, but our active support. Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman, Joseph Kearns, Joe Gilbert, and William Conrad. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen, with story by John Everett, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler is entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember at this same time next Sunday, another strange tale by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>